Welcome to episode 11 of Run With. Today I talk to James Dunn, otherwise known as the Morning Coffee Run. James knows a thing or two about marathons and ultra marathons, having completed over 25 marathons. James has gone from 130 kilograms to running the Marathon de Saab and a whole host of other challenges along the way. Today I talk to him all about his marathons, his ultra marathons, his challenges, and more importantly, what running has done for his mental health. So today I am talking with the fabulous James, aka at Morning Coffee Run. How are you today? Yeah, not bad. Highly caffeinated, but good. Highly caffeinated. So we have come to a lovely little coffee shop in Stowe in the World, is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, and we have got amazing coffee, cake, um, everything you need for a good chat. Definitely. Definitely all you need. Good chat. <laughs> okay, right, so shall we begin? Go on then. Go on then, let's begin. So let's um, tell people who don't know your story, how did you start running? Because you haven't been running all that long really. No, I've been running, well, I very had a very short running career about 12 years ago. I say short, I did one 10K, did about three training runs, and hated it, hated every single kilometer of it. And when I finished, I was like, never doing this again. Yeah. But I was like, I had the picture of me with a medal. I was like, I'll just put that on the wall. And that one medal will be all, all I need. <laughs> yeah. And then um, it kind of, it kind of all started. So that one run kind of came after I got drunk on my 21st birthday and said to everyone that was around me that I was going to run a marathon before I was 30. Um, and then I kind of forgot about it. And then when that year came up, I was like, I'll do a 10K. Hated it and then just stopped. And I kind of never thought about it again. Like I'd watched the London Marathon with my grandma and things. But other than that, that was my, I'd watch running from afar. Mm -hmm. um, but then it got to uh, 2015 and I, I went through a really bad patch of, of mental health and um, was weighing 20 stone and just everything was going in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I was living by myself. And I just remember one night sat on the sofa, I was, don't know what caused me to get up but I was like I need to do something now mm. and um, I got a pair of old beaten badminton shoes put them on and just went out the door mm. um, and weirdly I had put my name in the ballot for London um, the year before just completely as a joke didn't ever think I'd do it or train for it um, but it was all sort of led kind of perfectly I got into running um, again not very quick but I was doing it I was enjoying it and it was definitely helping my mental health um, and then I ended up booking in to do a half marathon in uh, the October. So I, th I started running in about sort of June, July time of that year and finished that half marathon and hit, basically did the same as I did for the 10K. Didn't really train, hated it. Was like, why, why do people do this? This is not fun. And then got home uh, and my mum phoned me and said, oh, there's a magazine for you uh, from the London Marathon. I was like, oh, I wonder why I've got a magazine. And then went to see them and it was, you're in. Yeah. Um, and I always, people always, complain the fact I got in the first time in the ballot um, but that one choice changed like everything for me and training for the marathon and running the marathon completely changed who I am as a person and like just every part of my life has changed because of that mm. um, so it kind of just led to all the ridiculous things I've done since so you have done such an awful lot I don't even know kind of where to begin with it but I absolutely love that you were one of these people that kind of like get into London Marathon and yet, like you say, so many people complain about people that just get into yeah. London and, and, and aren't runners. Um, but you've kind of proven, like, you know, you don't have to be the best runner or the most experienced runner to get into it and enjoy it and actually start something. Yeah, definitely not. I mean, the first year of running, when I got into the ballot, I thought, right, I'll do it for charity. So I, um, I did it for two charities. And basically, when I started sending people you know, requests for fundraising. I got a few of my friends were like, yeah, but everyone does a marathon. Why don't you do two? And it kind of, I'm just it's so easily swayed by peer pressure. So it ended up being four marathons, six half marathons, and a thousand miles in, a, in the first year of full year of running. So I went from running the, that half marathon in October, and then the, that, the year after that was all of that in the first year. Um, and I think I have a very addictive personality, and yeah. I think that idea of just doing a little bit more and doing a little bit more became so um, like appealing and being like, oh, I'll go and run a marathon in Copenhagen with my best friend, and then I'll go and run a marathon in San Francisco because I'd never been to America and wanted an excuse. And it kind of became that kind of running 
sort of enabled me to do things I'd always wanted to do, but never had the, the self-confidence to just go and do. Yeah. Um, but yeah, after that first year, everything just kind of snowballed even further. And I was just like, what else can I do? Yeah. Oh, there's ultra running. What's that? I love that you kind of got, you, you just jumped in with both feet and it's taken you all over the world as well with different experiences. Yeah. We'll talk about some of them. Um, but how many marathons have you done now? 25? 25, right? yeah. So London, the virtual London was uh, 25, which I actually did in coming around this town in Stone the World. Um, so I actually parked up where I used to live yeah. um, when I came out the door and did that first kilometer um, and did figure of eights around my car because I really wanted to kind of make the kind of full circle. I know it's horribly cheesy, but I just wanted that like <laughs> movie moment of going back and running on those, on those lanes. Um, and nothing had changed. I don't know why I thought it would all look different. Um, but yeah, 25 now in five, five years. years. Yeah, exactly five, five years. years. And that's an awful lot. It is, like, my knee would tell me that it's an awful lot as well. Okay. So you, <laughs> your knee is telling you, but um, I guess they're not all, so a mixed bag, road, trail. Yeah, mix, complete mix. I mean, I very much started in road running um, and then I did um, my first ultra um, and then that kind of led into more trail running when I was like, oh, I need to actually train for an, an ultra marathon. It's going to be trail. You've done a fair few ultra marathons as well. How many is it? Six? Yeah, I've done six. Um, so my first one was a 50 mile, so Lakeland 50 mile, which some people call one of the hardest 50 miles. Yeah. Uh, I picked it because it had a 24 hour cutoff. Mm. I didn't really think why it had a 24 hour cutoff. Why you need that time? Yeah, <laughs> like it's self navigated. There's no signs and it's really, really hilly. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I loved it, but it was that kind of moment of going, ah, this, this is actually really hard. Yeah. It's not flat. I think, I haven't, I haven't done Lakeland. I, I went straight for kind of the easier <laughs> ultras. <laughs> I mean, there's no such thing as an easy ultra, but it's just making it more difficult for yourself. I think when you get to, to that kind of distance, everything becomes harder. And you've also done Marathon de Salle. Yeah, so that's another thing of throwing myself on the deep end. I signed up to Marathon de Salle and I had not run a single ultra. So I, I signed, Lakeland was in June, uh, June I think, and I signed up Marathon de Saab in April. Um, okay, so what, you're sat there, and what makes you think, do you know what, I'm going to go and do one of the toughest foot races on the earth? I think it's, again, it's that addictive personality, being like, what else can I do? And um, by one of my best friends and I were planning to do it together, um, so he kind of gave me that little bit of self-confidence, a little bit of a push, yeah. and then he actually pulled out, so he didn't, he didn't when we signed up, I'd signed up, paid the deposit, and he was like, oh, I don't think I can do it, actually. Um, well, you're in there, mate. And I was in, yeah. you got to go. I was like, great, cheers for that. <laughs> <laughs> Not getting that deposit back. Um, but it was, it was like the best decision I've ever made. And luckily, I managed to have a friend got a, a, a place last, last minute, so he joined me, so I wasn't alone doing yeah. this kind of thing. But it was, I, I still looking back, like sat in the office, clicking the button to go, I don't think I ever comprehended what it was actually going to involve. And you stories a lot of it, didn't you? I can remember following your stories and watching your event, waiting for the updates each day. And I think some of them were hilarious. I mean, just I think there were some stories where you were just completely kind of like out of it. Yeah, they're not big on dignity, some of them, that's for sure. <laughs> they were real. Um, so what kind of preparation and planning went into, into that race? Like the planning, I'm quite like Excel driven, like spreadsheet, a little bit in it, and uh, like, that kind of ultra marathon is made for someone like me who like wants to plan everything, spends hours like researching like a spoon to work out the grams and like every little tiny bit. Okay, so that counts me out of that race then. <laughs> <laughs> There's also a lot of helpful blogs on um, people who have done and like YouTube videos. I watch a lot of YouTube videos yeah. just to like know like how do you go to the loo in the desert? Yeah. Like lit every everything you like how had a you query. Go, how do you go to the loo in the desert? Just pull down, your, pull down your shorts. No, they um they have like dig actual a dig a hole. If you're gonna do it out in the desert, dig a hole. Um, not, but they not, not for a wee though. No, we no, just, just go. Just. Yeah, um, but in the camp they had like a little like plastic loo that you went in. You had your own doggy bags basically. Yeah, yeah, I'm, very sophisticated. I'm all kids. I take kids out on day trips. Yeah, they're true. Kids poo in doggy bags. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, noted, Julie noted, put that one away for later. Um, but yeah, the, the, I just, the planning bit kind of made it for me because I love to kind of have some knowledge and control about what's going to happen. Yeah. Um, but in terms of training, I just kept time on my feet. I knew I wasn't going to run a lot of it. Um, so it was more just like walking a lot. Mm -hmm. um, I entered some ultras to try and to get acclimatized to it. 
Um, but it was mainly just kind of time on my feet, just like walking, yeah. um, like walking home instead of driving home. And weekends were spent a lot of time on your feet. I mean, it's not the most social thing, mm. training for an ultra or just training to run a marathon, I guess. But mm. um, ultra is just another level, especially for MDS, because it's you've got to keep doing it every kind of couple of days. You've got to keep going over and over and over again. Yeah. Um, so I was quite glad when it was over that I could have a social life again. What about, um, you do you have to do any kind of like heat acclimatization or anything for it? Yeah, see that I did, which was, I think still think one of the weirdest experiences I've ever had in my life. So they have um, a heat chamber in Silverstone Racetrack, which is relatively near to here. So you drive up and you, Everyone else is sat in this Porsche experience center. They've all paid like a couple of hundred quid to go drive Porsches and you're there in like running kit. Um, and they literally put you in an oven with a treadmill and they turn it up to 45 degrees. They measure how much you sweat and you're in there for like an hour. Yeah. Um, and I remember the first time I did it, I ran, I'd like to say I ran most of it on the first <coughs> session. In my head I did, I probably ran like one minute. But I remember getting out and going, oh my God, I've got to run multiple days and multiple mm. kilometers in that heat and going home and like shaking and being like, I don't think I can do this. Mm. But you're, it is amazing how you do acclimatize. So even though I was driving home in you know April weather in the UK, it got easier every time I went there. And I think it did make a massive difference when I got to, to the desert. Cause I never, apart from one small bit, I never really struggled with dehydration or heat exhaustion. I was really, really fortunate in the fact that I kind of, I become acclimatized, but I also, knew when my limit was being pushed and kind mm -hmm. of eased back every time and things so so it's kind of like being sensible and, and then listening to your body when you're out there and yeah. just adapting accordingly i guess yeah and just not doing anything stupid which is more often what i do in races so it's getting but you didn't do anything stupid at marathon to start off, did you uh okay. i did like a couple of stupid things so one don't we in a hole uh, in the desert because you don't know what's going to come out of there okay. um and number two make sure you're eating the right things. So on the long stage, which was 75 kilometers, yeah. about 20 kilometers from the finish, I decided it was time to have a chicken tikka, uh, like a boil in the bag meal, which was a thousand calories. And then wondered why I couldn't really move that oh, much and felt yeah. like sleeping, yeah. um, which then I was falling asleep as I was walking. Mm. So I then thought, you know what, caffeine's great. So I had um, like sachets of coffee, but they were like latte. Mm. So you could put them in, stir them and it would be nice frothy coffee, but don't eat them because that just makes frothy. I mean, you've got no saliva in your mouth because yeah, it's yeah, hot. Yeah. It was just one of the worst experiences of my life. Oh. And being in the dark crying because you can't chew a latte. Yeah. Not something you'd say from, um, you know, running a road race. You're really selling this. So. Yeah. <laughs> but overall, the experience was, how was the experience? Oh, it was amazing. I mean, when I arrived, I said I'd never do it again, mainly because yeah. it is so ridiculously expensive. Yeah. But if money was no option, I'd fly out today. Yeah. It was so incredible. It's the people that made the difference. Like Everyone says it, and it sounds really cliched, until you're there and you're in a tent in the middle of nowhere with well, only one person, but the rest of them were strangers. But we, you rely on each other so much, even though you're maybe not at the same pace. I mean, the two of the ladies who were in the next door tent we became really close with, um, Gemma came third. Mm. Um, so we were complete opposite spe ends of the spectrum of racing, but we all looked after each other. And when one person was struggling, the other person would lift them up and yeah. vice versa. And if, you know, you trade food like you were in prison and being like, oh, I need that. Um, and you'd go around and if you were struggling for something, there'd always be someone there willing to help. And I think that's what whenever I think of the pain of some of the days and actually racing, it's far outweighed by their like stupid antics we did just sat in the middle of a desert yeah. um, with your mates. It's just fantastic. Oh, I love that. And I, I think it epitomizes the running community as a whole kind of, oh, definitely. you know, that, that we are generally as a, as a community there for one another, there to offer advice and, and show our journeys. And you show a lot on Instagram. Yeah, I try to be as open as possible about everything I'm pretty open. I, yeah I try to be there's sometimes where I'm like I should just be a lot more open about it and then I realize that what I am sharing is quite open but I think I'm so used to other amazing Instagrammers like yourself being so open about stuff they're going through um, that there are occasions where I should just post again about how I'm struggling because I sometimes fall into the the spiral of not talking about mental health and then it's not until like Mental Health Awareness Day comes in and I feel like I have to post about it because I haven't been so open about it. Whereas every day there's a mental health battle yeah. in one way or another. Yeah. Um, so I try to be as open as possible. I always yeah. feel like there's a little room and, for and improvement. And I think by being, uh, from, from you looking at your feed and, and you being more open, it's, it's going to help other people because 
you did start running to help with your mental health. You said that you were at that point, you know, you were really depressed mm. and you were struggling with your mental health. Um, how important is running for you look, for looking after your mental health now? It's, it's everything still. Um, I thought it would change over time, so I knew that I had to do something. And that was running, but I, in the back of my mind, I was thought was maybe something will come along mm. that I, that will mean I won't need running anymore. And I'd done counselling in the past when I was younger, and thought, well, maybe I, that would be what I'll go back to when I can't run. But running is that. Um, it always it always helps to kind of process everything, and and I also find the community from from social media as well. Mm. There's always someone there who can kind of pick up on, maybe you haven't put it in black and white in text, but they can kind of see it in your stories or in what you're not posting. Yeah. Um, there's always someone there to kind of help you out because I think our community is, is, is filled with people who have had mental health struggles. Mm. Um, so they very much understand where everyone's coming from. Because mm. um, I always say, yeah, I, I was 20 stone when I started running, but it, it wasn't about losing weight really. Mm. I just needed something to help me. Um, so that's kind of a, a, an added, added bonus, I think it's probably the wrong word, but it, it was never about that for me. It was mm. about getting back on some sort of stable ground of mental health, mm. which it has been, and it, it, it's been incredible. Yeah, it's, it's obviously helped you with your mental health and obviously physical health as well. So there's only been benefits for you. Yeah. Do you um, feel that that gives you some added strength with these crazy adventures that you go on and these these things that you do? We've got some more to talk about, but, you know, like Marathon de Saab and, and different little challenges that you set yourself, are not really little, but these, <laughs> these challenges that you set yourself, do you think that's given you some strength for those? Yeah, I think it's a case of... Um, I, I have like a running mantra which is always forward, forward, always. Yeah. And like I know now having gone through like the darkest bits of mental health that as long as I keep showing up and putting one foot in front of the other, eventually it will get brighter. And it's the same with running really. You can go through, you can hit the wall or whatever you want to call it, but as long as you just keep moving forward, eventually it's going to get better or there'll be a finish line. Mm. But there will always be something that will help you out of it as long as you keep moving. Mm. Um, so it definitely... It definitely helps. And if we could pass on any bit of advice to someone who may be struggling with their mental health when it comes to running, would you? What would you say to them? Talk to somebody. Yeah. It always helps. Um, again, like when I, I first really started suffering in that year, I just shut everybody out. Everybody out. Um, and it wasn't until I started running um, that friends would start talking about the fact that I was running, and then it kind of led me to talk about the fact that I was struggling mm. um, and they all knew I was struggling but didn't understand maybe how much I was struggling um, but it is just just reach out even if it's just going for a coffee with somebody mm. it's surprising how much the small things will just mount up mm. and help in, in the long run. Do you think it's harder for as a male to open up? Yeah it definitely I mean that's one thing I've always been quite forceful on and being on social media is being open about my mental health mm. because I mean, I've never been that macho man, that strong man. But when I was, I went to boarding school at a very, very, very young age. Um, so I never opened up when I was there because I was bullied for being overweight, for being different and everything else. So I, I became very insular about talking about my feelings. And it wasn't until um, I went to university and people were suddenly open about talking about their mental health or, um, you know, about how much they were struggling with certain things in life. Um, and it... It took a long time for me to realise that it was okay to talk about the fact that you were struggling. Um, like I, I struggled through school but never talked to anybody about it, didn't talk to teachers or my family about the fact that I was struggling, I just kept it all all locked down. And that must have been an incredibly lonely place to be, to be able to, to not be able to, to discuss how you feel, to be able to be true to how you feel. Yeah, I mean I had one friend uh, uh, at school who is also the reason I started wanted to do a marathon. He, um, when we were at school, he ran the London Marathon and he did it in three hours and one minute. Ooh. I know. Um, but he, he was the one person that I really felt like I could confide with. And we're still, I mean, we started swimming together now. Um, and obviously he's been a real help with marathon running, but it was just one person. And I think that's kind of also how I view social media. If you can have one person yeah. open up by showing that it's okay to be open, I mm -hmm. think that's that's kind of what we should be trying to push more that people can open up and it is all right and people won't judge you for being vulnerable anymore absolutely i couldn't agree with couldn't agree with you more there i think you know it can be such a positive place for everybody mm. it's all be open and then say how we feel because mm. there's no point hiding behind this smoke screen of 
positivity and all the time because we're not positive creatures no. all the time you know we have feelings and emotions and it's okay to be up and it's okay to be down because we're not just robots with one middle line yeah there was always a, a phrase that i think i heard of i didn't come up with it at all but it was uh filter your photos not your words yeah and i, I like but it always whenever i start writing something that i'm like i've had a tough race but i'm like oh i managed to push through no 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 i had a really tough race mm. it was awful be okay with talking about how bad it was. Yeah. Your photo might look like you had a great time, but talk about how awful, you know, oh, mile 18 race, was. Because everybody does. You see a camera and you're like, oh, yeah. I'm having Thumbs a up. Time. <laughs> <laughs> so you always post the smiley picture, but actually, mm. it could have been just a really shit race. Yeah. And I've had many where I've just had all the positive. Oh, this is great! Yeah. Apart from London Marathon, actually, I think I've got pictures which have never come out of the vault. They might have to come out of the vault of me <laughs> walking like this. Yeah. But see, that's <laughs> great! <It's life. laughs> I mean, the best one is um, New York Marathon, and this is something I've probably, I don't think I've ever revealed on Instagram. So there's a picture of me uh, that I'm really proud of from New York Marathon, and I'm running and I'm like this. And I, yeah. I think I look really strong, and everyone's always, whenever I post, like, oh my god, you look amazing. Yeah. In reality, I'm singing This Is Me from Greatest Showman <laughs> as I come through Central Park. And it just has, happens to be the moment I see the cameraman. Uh, so I go from singing like this to like this in like an instant. <laughs> and they don't capture me yeah. singing full lung yeah. down Central Park. Yeah, that's um. great. So I can hold a tune too. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, hold is probably a bit generous. Okay, very well. <laughs> um, let's talk about, because you have delved into the world of FKTs this year. I have. And I love the idea of these. Um, so, can we explain what an FKT is? So, an FKT is the fastest known time, and is essentially uh, what traditionally was called a speed record. Mm -hmm. So, um, basically, the fastest time to complete a set footpath or set route mm -hmm. anywhere in the world. Um, and the great thing about fastest known time, and I've been very open about the fact that Obviously, I'm not an elite runner. I'm not going to rock up and you know um, go to the Pennine Way, way and, and beat Damien Hall's race. Like it's, it's never going to happen. But if you can find a, a local footpath near you, you can either register it. It might even be there already, mm -hmm. and you can go out and you can run at your own pace, and you'll have set a record that could stand for months, oh, years, yeah. wherever. Or if you're in my case, go and set your first one, and it gets beaten three weeks later. Oh. But it is. You sold it well. I did. I did sell it well. And in fact, the guy who set it, we're going to go and run together and do an FKT together in the future. So again, it's that great thing of running in social media. It creates this amazing yeah. community. But um, I love it because I'm a bit of a map nerd. So I love scrolling through like the different areas, finding these routes. I mean, I've got three planned at the moment. One is 27 miles. One is uh, 100-ish ish miles and the other one is 200 ish miles wow um, so that would also be a multi-day thing yeah and i'm going to do them all unsupported so carrying all my kit so basically everything bar well, everything bar water and the water you can only fill from natural sources or from public toilets okay and then is it wild camping along the way uh, so you can't legally can't wild camp in the uk this is another thing that i uh fell foul of because I, I was ready and raring to go and do um, an 84 mile um, FKT only to find out that the campsite I planned on was closed so I was like that's fine I'll just go and wild camp and then was like I remember there's a rule you can't do that in the so UK. B and B's on the way? B well then, so then, then you'd be crawling into so there's three the great thing about FKTs is there are well, there's actually four different ways you can set it so you could do yeah. it supported so full crew you know you're, you're cared through the whole way there's um self-supported uh, self so you can go into um, shops and get food along the way you can leave yourself baggies so you could set up a campsite essentially if you're going to do it in two days and then unsupported which is what I tend to do because no one wants to do it because it's and do you have to when you put when you do these times it doesn't say whether you did it supported self-supported yeah so you have to kind of prove and a lot of it is based on trust because essentially no one's going to be following you to make sure you well, nobody you, will know if somebody's jumped out of the bushes and handed you yeah stuff along the way exactly or yeah. you've just popped into the local cop and got an ice cream yeah. um so it is a bit of trust but you have to um you know your strava data gps data um you put photos and you talk about it as well mm -hmm. so there's sort of there is proof and obviously if you got to the elite levels it becomes a lot more stringent on what you can do and and how it's tracked um but as long as you, yeah, there's a lot of trust element with it but mm -hmm. that's the great thing about 
um, FKT during COVID time is you could just walk out your door and as long as the, the lockdown rules allow, you can go and do it whenever. Yeah, um, that, that, this is what I love, it's, a, it's something that is quite accessible, isn't it? Yeah, and there's, there's one that I really want to do, which I think I tried to convince you to do, which is the Donington Way, which is around here, and it is um, all the pubs that are supplied by the Donington Brewery, and I think it's 84 miles, and I think there's about 20 pubs. <sighs> Right, so, okay, how long after a stress fracture can you do? <laughs> well, you've got alcohol, so you probably wouldn't feel it. So I am going to do an FKT with James yeah. at some point, um, but I do need, a, I am currently broken. I have got a metatarsal stress fracture, which is, by the by, but we, we'll, we'll wait for me to be healed, and I think we'll do that as a future definitely. special episode, won't we? Yeah, Get definitely. Planned. So what's the... Where's the 200 miler? Is it a secret route? The problem is if I say it, I know it's a... As long as you're willing to plan, this is a route that anyone could do. Okay. So I might... Have people done FKTs on it? Uh, yes, but only in a race. It's okay. never been done by anyone unsupported. So again, I'm not quick enough to beat anybody, really. If someone goes and sets it, I will strug probably struggle to beat them. Okay. Um, so I might keep that one close to my chest. So there, there's a few local um, footpaths that I've kind of walked in the past. So the one that I'm, I really want to do is um, the Cotswold Way. So that's 106 yeah. miles. Um, no one's on it unsupported. Probably sport myself now and someone will go and do it. But it's okay. an amazing route. Uh, so go and do it if you fancy it. Um, but that was one I'd love to, uh, to do an FKT or just do it. Yeah, I mean, if it's gone, it's gone. It's not the end of the world. Yeah. But the great thing about FKTs is, yeah, if you've seen someone do it and beaten you, um, you could get a team together and go and do it, and you can still set an FKT as a team. Um, are there diff there's different categories, so is there like female, male? Yeah, mixed? so yeah, so uh, teams, male, female, and then supported, unsupported, and self-supported. So there's lots of different criteria. That's so exciting, yeah. 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 And, and again, it's the nerd in me. I love to plan all these things. So yeah. for the longer one, I found all the campsites and all the local loos. You can go and fill up your water. Um, and I, I, I'm a bit of a gear nerd. So again, I love researching like, oh, what could I need for that, that bit and for those things. So I think it, it's, especially during COVID, like during complete lockdown, I found it great because I could try and plan these adventures that as soon as we were allowed out, I could just go and do. Yeah. Um, and that's been a massive help to kind of yeah. go, okay, well, I'm stuck inside, but this is what I'm going to go and do. It kind of keeps you busy on a different level, doesn't it? Because you've got the planning and you've got all the research. Yeah. Yeah, I like that. And I, I like the fact that you you know, like you said, there's a 27 mile, there's 200 miles, so you can, it doesn't have to be a multi-day thing where you have mm -hmm. to kind of go to a B and b or not. <laughs> <laughs> it can be just a day out, it can be... Yeah, I mean, there are short ones, there are ones that are sort of 10 miles, or I think there might even be shorter ones than that, so... That's starting to sound a bit like Strava segments. Yeah, see, some people do say that, you know, mm -hmm. there's that grey area between Strava segments and, uh, and FKTs. But that's the, again, that is the great thing about um, all the technology that's coming in. You can do FKTs and it's all listed in a register, which means someone can go out and try and beat you. But it's that competition that keeps us all going mm. when there is no competition to be done, really, mm. with races not being, well, quite as much as around it's as we'd like to. It's competition, isn't it? It's, it's oh, kind yeah. of like, you know, encourage support and you, you don't want to go around doing things and just be kind of, all right, I'm done, that's it. Never done research. You want something to kind of like, Stoke your fire a little bit, make you want to go back out there and... Yeah, I mean, I even said when I finished the, the one I did, so Witchwood Way, which was 37 miles, I finished it saying, someone please come and do this, it's really beautiful. Wow, uh, and luckily, someone listened. Yeah, there's someone listened, <laughs> and then there was a team that went and did it a couple of weeks afterwards, so I'm really... And yeah. people kept messaging me like, oh, are you upset that it got beaten? I'm like, no, it's yeah, brilliant. It's yeah. I've kind of set this weird little challenge that yeah. for years, people might look at it, if, if the website stays up and all the records stay up, people might find it in 50 years' time and go, Oh, that looks like a fun thing to do on a weekend. We'll go and do that. And it was, you know, you were, you were the original. You were the first one to have done it. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. even if you're beaten, Nobody you still can have take it. Nobody that away from exactly. you. Exactly. Nobody can take that away from you. So we need to find untouched ones. Because I was looking at Offers Dyke Path. Now, that's a very popular one, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, I looked at that. Uh, I was up at your neck of the woods um, the weekend and was looking at other routes I could do. Um, there are quite a lot of FKTs around there as yeah, well. Yeah, and different parts of it, I think. Yeah. Because it's such a long one. I think it's almost like a week long or five days. Yeah, there's certainly, oh, there's a few around yours that are really long, like amazing there's routes to do. There's like Wide Valley. Yeah. Wide Valley, I think it's a Wide Valley, Valley Path, maybe. Um, but yeah, there's quite a few, but the office site is beautiful. Mm. But also at the moment it starts in Wales. I think it might finish in Wales as well. Yeah, see I was looking at that, mm. because obviously during the firebreak, um, I was meant to go up to Snowdonia that 
that weekend. So we went and looked at whales mm. from across the bay. <laughs> yeah, well, sorry, we'll just walk around this bit now. Yeah. Um, but there are tons. Like every everywhere around the world has amazing yeah. footpaths. That yeah. all it takes is to literally just get on fkt.com, I think, and you can just start searching and see what's available. Yeah. Um, and just go and set an adventure. It's fantastic. It is like a choose your own adventure mm. story. Yeah. Um, so it just it ticks all the boxes for me for for running now. Go and give it a shot. See if you can find an FKT and give it a bash. Definitely. Yeah. So let's talk about. So I love the FKTs. Um, you've been doing a bit of open water swimming lately. I have. Yeah. It's um, one of my lockdown kind of promises to myself. Well, it was actually before lockdown. Um, so this year was very much like the year of learning to swim. Yeah. Again, being overweight at school, I avoided the pool like it was going out of fashion. I had like ingrown toenails, inner ear problems. I once tried to tell a PE teacher I had my period because I didn't want to get in the pool. <laughs> yeah. Literally anything to get away from it. And my um, my partner is, a, is an open water swimmer. She does 10 kilometer swims all the time. And I was like, she started running and doing a lot more running and I was still like, no, I don't want to swim. Why do people do this? Mm -hmm. um, so I got in the pool before lockdown started, started swimming, wasn't really enjoying the pool because again my subconscious mm. body issues were coming to the forefront every time we got out um, but then obviously lockdown and pools were shut but the lakes were open mm. um, so as everything eased we we went and I bought a wetsuit and tried to fit my lockdown curves in there and as soon as I got in the water I was like this is this is it this is incredible and it's almost the same feeling I had when I first went running it's that kind of light switch moment mm -hmm. of everything feeling very much at ease you're on calm waters um, and there's no time pressure, like the lake is so big that unlike a pool, if someone wants to overtake you, it's kind of awkward and you get pushed a bit. But in the lake, if you want to go slow, you just move to the side and there's enough room and everyone swims past. Mm. So I very much kind of caught the bug very quickly with that and typical me fashion, signed up for a five kilometer uh, swim, having done a couple of hundred meters in, in okay. open water swimming. It's still three miles, three miles is a lot. Yeah, it was, it was a long way. Uh, <laughs> And like I did, I obviously trained, I got a, I luckily I, uh, there was a coach at the local lake, um, but I still can't do front crawl properly. So I was like, I'm not going to be able to swim five kilometers. Mm -hmm. So it sort of built, built up and built up. And I did do the entire five kilometers breaststroke, which there are not very many people who do that because it's ridiculous. And it took me... Still five kilometers. Exactly. It took me two and a half hours, which was uh, like an hour longer than I thought it was going to take. <laughs> but I loved it. And it, it yeah. was... It was very much the same feeling of when I did my first half, looking back. I, I came in the last 1% in my first half I ever ran, and I definitely came in the last 1% of the swim, but it doesn't matter. I did something that I didn't think I could do before, mm. and now I know I can, and nothing that happens after this will change that fact. Mm. You've done that. It doesn't matter if it took you, you know, hours and hours or minutes. It's the same thing, um, and I loved it, and it's... Even now, even though it's freezing cold, um, I've started doing cold, what they call cold water or ice swimming, where you're wearing booties, you've got gloves. Um, there was a lady swimming yesterday with a bobble hat on. It's, just, it's brilliant. It is amazing. Um, but the community is, is, is similar to running. They're all really supportive. There's people checking on you if you're, if you're struggling during the swim. Um, and it has just been another kind of extra bit of, while I can't run quite as much as I want to because my knee's not great, um, the swimming has kind of filled that void of kind of challenging myself. And that's amazing because I think as runners we struggle to find something that replicates running when we can't run as much. Yeah, so we're very kind of concrete yeah, thinking. Yeah, yeah, running or it's running or nothing, yeah. you know. Like, but I think it's amazing that you found something. You can see when you're talking about it, it kind of it's giving you a little spark. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. It's a ridiculous thing to do, but. I love it and um, I went to North Wales before the fire break um, and swam in a lake that was you know no one had really swam in before and it was in the foot of a mountain that I love and I've looked at this lake before and swam in it and looked up at this at the mountain in ways I'd never seen before yeah. and it is that kind of the that weird thing you would never have thought you would have do, done before but now it just seems so normal yeah I'll jump in a lake in yeah. the middle of October that's completely normal yeah. and I just it's the same with running like you wouldn't go out and run in the rain but now that's completely normal like why wouldn't you go out and run in the rain yeah. it's um just these wonderful things that you do and they become so normal until you look back at them and go yeah that was weird that i did that but now i love doing that and i think that's why i love running and all the different like adventures i've had within running it's just doing things that you never thought were possible before 
and it doesn't matter when you're old and grey. I've, I've lived by a motto of um, we're all stories in the end. It was a, a phrase that my granny and I used to talk about. And even when I'm old and grey and I can barely get out of a chair, I mean, I can barely get out of a chair now, but um, I can tell my grandkids of the time that I ran across a desert. They probably won't believe me, but I'll have a tiny medal that I probably still polish mm -hmm. that will show that I did. And those amazing stories will be, be there after you've gone and people will say, yeah, granddad went and ran across the desert or he ran a marathon, ran a sofa. Like these stories will always remain. And I think that's why I keep pushing and finding these weird and wonderful things to do because I love creating these love bizarre that. stories. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And as a mother as well, I think it's just, yeah, I can, you're absolutely right. It's something to pass on to younger generations and mm. your family and for people to remember you by. Some people might say it's a bit morbid thinking about when you've, you've, you've gone or when you've mm. left, but it's, it's your legacy, isn't it? It's what yeah. you did with your life, how you made the most of your life. Yeah, definitely. I mean, my grandma, that we came up with, sort of taught this phrase through, she had the most bizarre and amazing life. She lived in India, she was um, one of the co-brokers in the war, and but she very much encapsulated that. And when, mm. when she passed on, we talked about these stories and we all exchanged these stories that maybe you hadn't heard of. And I think that's why I love talking to runners, because you get this these stories that maybe you haven't heard that they've done. And um, I just love that part of, of, of running and adventuring is the stories that we tell each other, mm. um, usually not fit for camera, but they're just usually hilarious and really inspiring. I think it's brilliant. Yeah, I love that. Um, so let's talk about, you've got a new challenge on the horizon with your 20 marathons in 20 days. Yeah, so that was going to be this year, 2020, but um, there was a little virus that meant yeah, I couldn't do it. Um, so the idea is to push it and do it next year. Sometime, I'm, I'm still working out the, the plan. The original idea was to run it with um, my best friend who sadly now can't do it because of work commitments. So um, I'll be doing it sometime next year, finding ways to do it. Even if COVID is still around, I'm definitely going to do it next year. I just couldn't, I couldn't face planning something that big, um, not knowing the restrictions that were going to be in place. But now I'm very much like, it will get done next year and nothing will stop me from doing it. Yeah. Um, because I want to raise money for mind. I want to, to, again, show people that you can look like I do and do another weird and wonderful challenge. It doesn't matter. Um, but also just being open about your mental health when you're out running with people because the idea is that I will run with people um, and a lot of them hopefully I wouldn't have met before and it'd be just lovely to chat and exchange stories along the routes. Um, so yeah, the idea was to travel all around the UK and start in, uh, in Belfast and travel to um, Scotland, through England and Wales and then finish um, in London. I don't know what it will look like now in terms of the itinerary but I'm hoping I can kind of recreate the original plan. Mm -hmm. um, it just depends where we are restriction-wise. And when you're doing this, is it going to be an open invitation if anybody wants to come along and join? Yeah, that's the idea. I'll hopefully put it on social media and once there's a plan, I'll be able to do but people can sign up. So again, we know it's going to be COVID safe. But yeah, the, uh, the hope is I can be as open as possible and everyone can join in. And it doesn't matter if you're doing one mile or the full. The idea was to create loops um, that were a quarter of a, a marathon long. Mm. So if maybe you were just on 10k, you could come and join for a quarter. Or if you were pushing to do a half marathon, the idea is it will be going at a pace so anyone can join. Yeah. Um, and if someone wants to run a bit faster, hopefully there'll be someone there that can run with them. But because there'll be loops, we'll all be involved with each other's um, running. So there'll be a, a sort of fun community spirit. Yeah. I mean, I definitely won't be going very fast. So if you want to go nice and slow, you can come run with me. But there'll be opportunities to go as fast as you want to go or as slow as you want to go. Although I do find generally that faster runners, because you know I'm more of a fun pace, I like to say, <laughs> um, but faster runners don't mind slowing down for us runners that yeah. are slower than them. Um, and I think it's, a, it's, it's quite a nice thing actually, again with the running community, is that fast, slow, whatever, we can all come together and run. Yeah. As one. Yeah, that's the, the, the guy I was going to run with this year. Um, he's the chap who ran three hours and one, one minute when I, was, uh, when I was young. And he's now a 2.39 marathon runner. But the idea was eventually he'd slow down to my pace because he'd knacker himself out in the first few days and then he'd be running at mine because we've never run a race together. But we planned to do 20 marathons together. But we very much said, you know, it doesn't matter. Mm. Everyone can run at their own pace and eventually we'll all meet in the middle along the, along the loops. Yeah, I love that. Um, I will share all of James's socials because you've got, also got an amazing blog, which we haven't touched upon, which is an award-winning blog. Yes, it is. An award-winning <laughs> blog, and I'll put the link up for that as well. Um, I love your blog. 
How much do you love writing? Because it comes across that you're you're very good at writing, but it comes across that you really enjoy writing. Yeah, I really do. It's it's something I've always enjoyed. So the blog actually existed before I was a runner. It was called Coffee and Countries uh, back then. And it was um, when I went to live in India uh, after uni, it was talking about my, my journey out there and then the photography that I was taking. And then it didn't become a running blog until obviously I started running, mm. but it completely transformed my writing and finding this thing to talk about. Um, but I love it. I, I love even, you know, reviewing a shoe or talking about, you know, Marathon de Saab, each bit has a really fun element I love writing about. Um, and writing about MDS was a mission. And it took me, I think, eight months to actually fully <laughs> write it down. Um, but I loved every minute of writing it. Sometimes it does feel like a chore and then you sit back and read it and I'm like, okay, I really enjoy doing that. Yeah. Um, and I think even if no one read it, I'd still be writing it because I just love putting it down on paper. Um, again, the same way of the moral stories in the end, mm. there's something that exists that talks about these, these journeys I took. So mm. if anyone is bored enough to eventually find it, they can read about the, the I've, stupid I've stories to, I've done. I've got to hold my hands there because I'm not a very, I did try blogging a bit and sometimes every now and again I'll check out a post, you know, just, I feel like writing something so I'll, I'll back when it, but I'm not very good at reading other people's blogs. Apart from yours, yours is one that I do enjoy reading. Well, so when you. you do put stuff up. <laughs> So try not to leave it eight months after your 20 and 20 challenge. Yeah. You need to be really reading material. Um, but I'll just put the links below. So if anybody would like to check out um, and go and support and follow and encourage James on his future. Anything else coming up? There's always something. There's usually something with you, isn't there? Yeah, it? there's always some stupid adventure yeah. that I'll think of. There's definitely quite a few for next year. Um, Including RFKT. Including no, RFKT. No, it's on camera, so he has to do this with me. Yeah. I, James Dunn, agree to do an FKT. <laughs> no, definitely, I'm more excited to do one now. Yeah. It'll be so much fun. Yeah, it will be a lot of fun. And I think it'll be, it'll be a nice thing as well, hopefully next year when there's more of a grip on COVID and we can kind of socialize more. Are you missing the racing scene at all? Weirdly, not as much as I thought I was. Mm -hmm. um, I very, I did, I've done a few races and they were put on amazingly well. I'm not taking that away, but I just don't miss it as much as I thought I would. Yeah. Again, with FKTs coming along, and I've enjoyed finding challenges to set myself as well. Yeah. Um, don't get me wrong, I can't wait to go and run, you know, London or Chicago or whatever, but I'm not missing it as much as I thought I would, mm -hmm. or much as I feared I would. I think when lockdown first started, I was immediately like, what, what am I gonna do now? Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not a runner, mm -hmm. there's no medals to be got, which is that weird thing that we, I think we, become maybe because of social media, but we, we look to the next race or the next challenge or the next bit of bling mm. and don't actually appreciate what it is to be a runner. And I think that's one thing I've definitely looked back on and gone, why am I actually running? Mm -hmm. I'm not just running to go and, you know, run at London and get a medal. I'm actually running because of my mental health, because yeah. of the community. Um, so maybe that's why I'm not quite missing as much as I could, because I've, mm. I've realized that it's actually that internal thing. Yeah. The medals are an amazing plus, don't get me wrong. But cherry on top. Yeah, it? definitely. It's nice cherry on top. But I, I, I've got to say, I, I agree with you completely. And I do miss the race day atmosphere and stuff, but it's been nice to kind of strip it back to basics and realise just why you run and, and what running means. And yeah. it's so much more than races, times, medals. Yeah. It's, it's what it provides each and every one of us. I mean, it's different reasons for all of us, but... Essentially, we all run for ourselves, don't we? Yeah, and I definitely don't miss queuing for the lose. It's great. No, I have <laughs> one socially distance, no, a couple of socially distance races, and I absolutely loved the fact that it was just turn up, no queues at the toilets, just pop into the <laughs> toilet, walk straight to the start line, off you go, no kind yeah. of, do you know, hanging around, <laughs> shivering, or in the queue, tapping, and wondering what you're going to go into when you go into the portal. Yeah. Yeah, it was really good, actually. I enjoyed it. <laughs> I sort of think maybe I'm not that so I'm not a social person. I'm, not, I'm just not sociable. Yeah, I'm definitely noticing that. But like, <laughs> I still want to find like people to like friends to run with, and yeah. and that kind of element has got even stronger for me. Yeah. But yeah, I don't miss you know standing next to people the while they're stuff. yeah pushing and shoving and doing a weird stretch that you shouldn't be looking at. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't miss that element. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, I've absolutely loved talking with you today. Yeah. It's been an absolute joy. Um, you've got so many stories, and I think it's probably a lot that we haven't touched upon. Um, but if anybody do, if anybody does want to go and check out James' stories, please do go and visit his Instagram or his blog. 
Um, and I guess that's it. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. You're very welcome. Thank you for the cake. The brownie was <laughs> lovely. I had to stop eating it because my mouth was sticking together. <laughs> <laughs> I really hope you've enjoyed today's episode. Please do like, share and subscribe. Hit the notification bell so you know when future episodes are coming out. If you would like to follow along with James, then please do check out his links below. I will be back soon sharing some more inspirational runners with you. But until then, stay safe and happy running.